Good morning. Uh, Public Protection and Judiciary Committee will come to order and uh, we'll call roll call. Janet? Bob Fiedler? Uh, present. Paul Adams? Uh, Paul's excused. Mark Carlson? Uh, I think Mark will be here just a little late. Kathy Lee? Present. Tim Ramberg? Present. Um, we have our minutes and if there's no objection to the minutes, uh, they'll be approved. Um, public comment. Do we have any public comment today? I see nobody in the audience. Public comment again? Nobody. Uh, business items. We'll call on our county administrator, Mr. Witt, for the financial reports. And budget report, I guess. Yeah, I won't spend uh, much time at all on the financial report. Um, we're just a little over midway through the year. Everything's looking good. Um, but if you had any specific questions on the financial report, I'd be happy to answer those for you. No questions on the financials. We can move on to the uh, the budget then, if you please, Mr. Chair. All right. So the first thing you'll note about the uh, the budget is that it looks just like the financial report. Uh, so we do that on purpose so that we only have to train you on one format. Um, when we uh, we start the budget out, uh, we have a hundred and twenty million dollar budget. All of the departments make their requests for things that they need and want uh, for 2023. Um, when I add all those up based upon our projected revenues, it puts us about a million dollars over um, what we can have in expenses. So from this requested budget column, which is on the, on the far right, we will have to cut $1 million of those expenses or add $1 million of revenue. Cutting expenses is easier than adding revenues. Um, so as we go through the budget, Sort of keep in mind that, you know, one out of 120 um, has to come out of there. It will have to be cut um, because when I submit a balanced budget to the county board in October, um, it'll be balanced through that, uh, those cuts. Um, the other way um, that I want you to focus on the budgets is uh, when you first see uh, this departmental sheet, and, and we're looking at the circuit court here, it's the first one. Um, you know, my eyes jump to a couple of things right away, and, and that's what I'll point out to you. The first thing is the very top line. So general property tax levy. Um, so as elected officials, you're representing uh, the constituents, and the constitu constituents see the general property taxes. And so every department has other revenues, but they pretty much all have this general property tax line. And this is the amount of property taxes is needed to support that department. So you can see, um, if we look back at last year, we had budgeted $881,000, and this year uh, we're budgeting $928,000. So right away we look at what is that difference. Uh, so we have a $47,000 difference in increase. Um, so that's the first thing I look at is property taxes. So what is the impact to the taxpayers? What I then jump down to is net wages and fringes. Um, the net wages and fringes, the departments have no control over. Um, so the WRS benefits, the health insurance, even the wage rates, they don't have any say in that. Um, so when you see an increase here, um, and you do see um, about a $40,000 increase, not too far off of what their tax levy increase is. So most of that increase into the circuit court uh, property tax increase is attributed to wages and fringes, so out of their control. Uh, so right away you can take them off the hook for that part of the increase. Um, what I have built into uh, the budget um, is a very uh, small amount of health insurance. Health insurance makes up about 10% of our expenses in the county, but we're only looking at a 1.4% increase in health insurance for next year. Um, so a very manageable amount. Uh, the other large increase, though, is going to come in wages and fringes. Um, so I do have um, a 5% average increase budgeted for wages. So that is a 3% COLA and a step increase is what I have budgeted for all of the employees for 2023. Uh, if you look at the consumer price index, um, the rise in inflation, which is still a lot higher than that, um, I felt it was uh, something that we needed to do and it was one of the top budget priorities for the county board um, to take a look at compensation for employees. And that's both for recruitment and retention. Uh, one of the issues that we have is retaining employees and then filling those vacant positions. So increasing the wage grid with a 3% COLA 
and then um, uh, that continued uh, retention of the step increase is what we're looking at um, to help address that. But that 5% increase then has um, a fiscal impact for the county, and you can see that impact then uh, in that increase in wages and fringes. So after wages and fringes, though, the next thing that I'll look at is I'll drop down to uh, the end here, and I will look at their operating expenses. So the operating expense went from 129 to 136. Now that's directly attributed then uh, to the department. Um, so they've asked for $7,000 more than they had asked for last year. So then uh, looking at that number, how big of a change is that? Then I'll go back and start looking at individual line items to see where that change was and, and drill into uh, what the um, reason is for those changes. Um, and in the circuit court, um, they're fairly uh, minor changes. Um, you see court commissioners is up by um, uh, $3,000 there. Um, so that's what I'll do then is I'll go through and I'll look at where the changes are. $500 for cell phone where they didn't have anything budgeted in the prior year, uh, but they do have a history of, of spending money on cell phones. So it's things like that that I go back and I look for. Um, so again, we're going to cut a million dollars out of the budget. We're not going to do that all today, not here, um, but that is something that has to be done through this process. We'll go on to the, uh, the next one if there is no questions on the circuit court one. We'll go on to uh, Justice Support Services. Um, and I should say, too. Ken, uh, can I ask, yep. could, could you remind, this, these numbers reflect your work with the department heads over the last three months and their requests? These numbers reflect their requests that they made in uh, July. And so um, uh, you can see that this report was run on August 4th. And so they made all of their requests by the end of July. I ran this report uh, to update it at that date. So um, we're working with about a month old uh, data. So I have been working with the department heads um, on the recommended column. So where we're at in the budget process is we're going through the requested column uh, as final input for the county administrator to say these are really important items or what are you budgeting money here for? We totally disagree with that policy direction that we're heading. Um, so you can give me that input before I make my final cuts to the budget to get to a balanced budget. Um, but I have met with all of the department heads and, and I've identified things that I would cut out of the budget. Um, but I'm here today to get input from you to see what's important for you or what is not important for you um, so I can clarify those changes that I plan to make. At the October Committee of the Whole meeting, we'll go over the county administrator's recommended budget and that will be a balanced budget and then I will go over each of the changes that I made through the budget process. All right, so just to support services, um, still a new department. The, um, uh, the expenses that we have um, are still in flux is what I'm gonna say. So as we're developing uh, the new processes uh, within that department, um, you know, th this year will take us a year and a half through, but some of those processes have changed through that, through the past year. And so what I'm trying to do really with their budget is to catch up to where their experience is. Um, and so I tell them, I go, spend the money where you need to spend it. We'll adjust the budget in the future years. So I think the 2023 budget will get us a lot closer. I just want to preface it with, I don't know that that's going to be the final changes for them. Um, I would anticipate by 2024, we're really solidified and uh, they're like circuit court. We're not, nothing new, new to report here. Um, but for them, a lot of their, their stuff is still in flux. Um, their general property tax is about the same as it was last year. Um, but I will point out that this um, federal awards was doubled up. Um, and so we have that in there uh, recorded twice. So that's one of the changes that I've already noted. I'm going to have to decrease that revenue, which will increase that property tax amount. Um, so there's other changes uh, within their budget also that we'll make. Um, some of their bigger uh, increases um, were in uh, purchase services. So you can see we budgeted 75. Through August 4th, we had already spent 67. So we've upped that to 130,000. So that's one of those changes in process. It's things that we're learning and developing uh, as we're moving along here. Um, so things like that are going to continue to change. 
other professional services um, much higher than what we had budgeted last year. Uh, operating supplies, um, those are up uh, from where they were last year. And those are like uh, test kits and stuff like that uh, that they're purchasing. Um, so these are things that their department does need. Uh, and we'll go through that uh, with the department and, and clarify exactly um, where we have to be on each of those line items. But if you had any specific questions about some of their changes, um, I'd be happy to answer those or uh, we have Phil here also today to help answer those questions. Any questions on justice support services? Uh, not necessarily a question, but for either yourself or Phil, as, as I understand it, uh, just this week we're getting up to full staffing. Is that correct in that department? Uh, yes, that's correct. So yesterday started um, a new um, individual for us, a new pretrial case manager. So we are up to full staff now in justice services. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that might be a first, huh? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Milestones. <laughs> We'll move on then from uh, Justice Support Services. We'll go to uh, the Clerk of Courts. So Clerk of Courts, we jump to that first line. We look at what their property taxes is up. So it's up $70,000. Uh, and then we wanna jump down to net wages and fringes, look at what's going on there. That's up by $71,000. Um, you will see some additional increases in some of their other expenses. They do have some additional increases in some of their revenue light items. Um, like court fees and cost of services, that was up by $20,000. Um, so some of those uh, increases in their interest revenue went from 20000 to 50000 So they have some additional revenues that they're bringing to the table also, uh, which offset then some of their increased um, operating expenses. So if we look at their operating expenses, they went from 563 up to 615000 So, you know, there's that 50000 offset that they brought in of new revenues. Um, so we do scrutinize those. Uh, just because you bring the revenues doesn't mean I let you spend the revenues. Right, Christy? Um, so we do go back and we look at those. Uh, so where we're seeing some of those increases is legal services, court-appointed counsel, interpreter services. Uh, these are things that uh, the clerk of court says that they have to have. So I tend to believe her in that. I think we have a question. Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, I wrote down a couple of questions, so I thought I'd list them out here. But uh, no, <laughs> being a bean counter, I, I had to do that. Uh, I noticed that health insurance. <laughs> I noticed that I noticed that health insurance is down in a couple areas. I, th I think yep. this area is. Uh, um, I, uh, I think everywhere else it was mm -hmm. up, but I, is there a? Yep. So we budget departmentally um, based upon the actual employees selections within those departments. So as personnel change, you may have um, an employee that was married that had a family plan, uh, but the employee that replaces them is a single employee. Um, and so they have a different employee cost. And so it's just the composition from one year to the next. If every employee stayed exactly the way they were, you would see a 1.4% increase. But the other changes are reflective of the change of personnel. Got competition now for my jokes. <laughs> All right. Uh, who knew the budget could be so much fun, huh? Right, Tim? <laughs> All right. Medical examiner. Uh, when we look at the medical examiner, general property taxes went from three twenty to three hundred twenty-four thousand. So there's a four thousand dollar increase. Net wages and fringes um, were up by four thousand dollars. So that's where that increase was. Um, their total operating supplies uh, was up by about $300 total. Um, so not a whole lot to see uh, within the medical and examiner. One of the areas I actually want to see a decrease, though, is the other professional services with the new uh, CT scanner coming on board, which I talked to at my administrator group. They thought I was making a joke. Um, I said that we have the CT scanner now, and they're welcome to come and use it, I mean, for a fee. Uh, but a couple of them thought it was a good idea then after they realized I wasn't joking. Um, so I'm trying to drum up some business for you there. Um, so that other professional services is where autopsies are charged to, and we're hoping that the new device that we have 
will actually help decrease that uh, in future years. So we're looking forward to a decrease in that expense, offset by some other increases that uh, we'll probably have with that new device. But I'll keep moving on then. We'll go to uh, district attorney. Uh, so the district attorney, the general property taxes, if you look at that, um, so it went from a million seventy two thousand up to uh, one point two five three. Um, so there's almost a two hundred thousand dollar increase, hundred eighty thousand in there. Um, so we want to take a look at what is causing some of that change. Uh, if we drop down to um, the net wages and fringes, uh, we're looking at uh, about one point two million up to about one point three seven seven. So that's a large increase. So within that increase is a requested new position. Um, so we don't have a lot in the budget. Um, I will point out this is one of the changes um, that was requested though, uh, and that's to add an additional uh, support staff position in the district attorney's office. Um, so we'll have to evaluate that, um, whether that uh, survives the budget or not, um, considering the amount of cuts that we have to make. Um, but part of the, their increase in net wages and fringes is not just the, the normal changes, it's that additional position. Uh, if we look at their operating expenses then, um, they went from 98000 to 95000 um, They'd moved one of their uh, computer into an asset account, so really they're about the same as they were the prior year. Uh, so no increases in their operating area. Uh, it's primarily just the wages and fringes where we're seeing all of that increase come from. I notice there's no phone on there. Is that a missing item or they don't get charged phone? Um, yeah, it just means that they don't have any county phones. Um, so I don't know if you guys have state phones in the district attorney's office. Yeah. Okay. All right. They don't have any county phones as much as, much as I can tell you. <laughs> We'll move on from the district attorney, child support. So under child support, you're actually going to see these little brackets around these numbers. Um, so that means it's a negative number. Right, Supervisor Ramberg? Um, so a negative number. So why does child support have negative general property taxes? Well, that's because that department actually generates more revenue than they have in expenses. And so there's no tax dollars going to support the department. They're actually producing more revenue. So the way that we have to account for that is we create a negative general property tax number for that department. If you take this line item, this 411110 line item, and you add it up across all of the budgets, and you add all of them together, that's the exact amount that goes is our tax levy amount. We'll approve a resolution in November levying a specific tax amount. The sum of all those lines throughout the budget equals that tax amount. So I have to put a negative number in here in order to get to the right number at the end of the day. And so that's why you see um, a negative property tax reflected for child support. You'll see that in register of deeds, uh, child support. Which, hmm? Oh yeah, the uh, county treasurer's office. That's the other one. So those three departments are the ones that have uh, negative property tax amounts. Um, so if we look at the rest of uh, child support, uh, what's going on there, um, their net wages and fringes are up by about $20,000, and their operating expenses are up by about $1,000. Uh, so not a lot of change going on there, other than um, the routine changes that we're seeing with net wages and fringes. All right, we'll move into uh, law enforcement. So the sheriff's office is broken up into several different cost centers. Um, the first one, law enforcement, this is the, the patrol side of the department. Um, so if you look at property taxes, they go from $8 million to $8.2 million. Uh, so there's a $200,000 increase in there. Um, part of that also was um, other federal payments. That other federal payment was CARES dollars that we had applied uh, last year to offset their expenses. That's part of our structural deficit going into 2023. We offset um, their union contract uh, increase in 2022 with uh, the grant dollars uh, to help afford it in 22. In 23, then we have to absorb that cost. Um, 
So that becomes the structural deficit, but that goes away uh, and then um, uh, it's absorbed elsewhere uh, within the budget. So part of the increase you're seeing is, is that dollar amount going away. When we look at um, net wages and fringes, I will point out though, uh, you see that they're almost identical to what they were last year. I did find an error in um, the wages calculations. So the wages we're calculating, they went from 3.9 million to 3.8. So we did not decrease uh, expenses by $100,000 in our wages. What happened was the system calculated based upon an eight hour shift, which is what we had historically been under. But last year we switched to a 12 hour shift. Um, so it did not catch that automatically. So I have reconciled that since then. Uh, it also added two to $300,000 of extra expenses into the budget. That is accounted for in the million dollar number that I told you before. Um, so that's um, included within there. Uh, but I did just want to point out that we'll be making a correction on that in the county administrator recommended budget. Um, we have that corrected and fixed. Um, so we'll move forward with the, uh, the right number there. Um, so just affecting uh, your, your salary and, and wage amounts. Uh, if we look at their operating expenses, um, they're up uh, about $15,000 in total operating expenses. Um, they've decreased their vehicle operating, uh, but then they've increased in a few other areas. Um, their liability insurance has increased. Uh, that's a number that I give them. Uh, it's an allocation based upon a 10-year rolling formula of claims and, and other data uh, that support that. Um, and then the rather larger increase was in um, software subscriptions and renewals. Um, so if you look at uh, that new software system that we had, um, there's ongoing maintenance fees associated with that, and so we're seeing increases in that uh, to account for. Otherwise, most of the sheriff's budget is um, pretty similar to prior years. Any questions on the sheriff's patrol side of the budget? We'll get into the corrections uh, division then. So this is the jail. Um, so the jail, when we look at general property taxes, they go from 4 million to 4.3 million. Um, and again, they had $125,000 of federal grant monies that went away. Um, so that was part of the structural deficit that we have to absorb elsewhere in the budget. Um, they also have 12 hour shifts. Uh, so the system did not automatically calculate that. Um, so, your 1.9 million is going to increase. And the other um, error that I found was we had two lieutenants that were not classified as salary. They were classified as wages. Uh, so we moved them back to a salary. Otherwise, uh, we were sitting at 317,000 in salaries prior, and we're at 165,000 this year. Uh, so that was sort of a signal to me that something might be wrong. Um, so they were just down within the wages. And then the wages, once they roll up to 12 hours, about the where they're at right now. Um, so again, an increase there that will be corrected. It has been accounted for in the million dollars total that we need to cut from the budgets. The other changes then within um, the jail budget, um, let me get to it. Well, if we look at the, the bottom line, their operating expenses went from just over a million to 1.2 million. Um, so there's a good $250,000 increase in operating. <laughs> So that's coming mostly from other professional services. Um, so that other professional services, that's the jail's medical contract. Um, and so we've been uh, bidding that service out. We just know that uh, medical costs, um, especially in this um, arena, are really uh, increasing rapidly. And so we have a large amount of an increase budgeted there. Um, that's one of the areas where um, We've tried to mitigate this with the use of the opioid funds. And so uh, the county board has authorized um, the behavioral health department to hire um, a mental health professional that would be embedded in the jail for 40 hours a week. That was a service that was provided within this medical. Um, and so that's actually one of the changes that I'll look at making is reducing this because of the other action that the county board took uh, to offset um, that position with an opioid grant. So it's all the little pieces that come together. So the action that you guys took there helps this part going forward here. Are there other questions then on the, uh, the jail budget?
We're going to do emergency management. Um, so you can see last year they were at 62,000, they went up to $90,000. If you look at their total wages and fringes, went from um, 147 to 158, so a little bit of it is, is um, within the net wages and fringes. If you look at operating expenses then for emergency management, uh, they actually decreased then from 31 to 26. Um, so they've, the reason they decreased those, they've actually cost shifted some of those over to the, um, the Sheriff's Department budget. That's the $8 million budget that we looked at a couple budgets ago, uh, so we didn't even hardly notice the, the cost shift there. Those are pretty easily absorbed. I'll move on to emergency communications then. Uh, so emergency communications went from $2.3 million to $2.4 million, so about $100,000 increase. If we look at their net wages and fringes, um, they're up by about $60,000. So. Uh, 1.82 million to 1.88 million. If we look at their operating expenses, they went from 507,000 to 554. So there's a $50,000 increase. So we go back and we try to identify where that is. And we can look at their software subscriptions and renewals. The big number is right in the middle of the screen there. They went from 336,000 to 382. So right there, we found where the, the big increase is. And again, that's the software uh, that we're using um, that was implemented, is it uh, two years ago now? Yeah. Um, the other big change in emergency communications is the whole, um, uh, Terry's here so he can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's the, um, uh, the across the river ambulance, there was some stuff that had to happen uh, in order to get them communicating correctly. And so we ended up picking up a, a bigger chunk of operating expenses with the software in order to account for um, being able to communicate back across the river. That's the layman's term for it. He can give you the technical stuff if you want to not understand it as well as I do. But, um, so part of that increase, though, is attributed to that. And part of it is the annual increase that uh, we see within that software. And that is the end of the, uh, the budget presentation. My apologies for dragging it on. Um, I, I, I appreciate the lasering out the levy because from my perspective, we got three issues that we want to make sure that we delineate and, and know the difference. Number one is the levy that our uh, property taxpayers are burdened with. Number two is the budget, and over my experiences, people get them mixed up. The budget is the total that we're spending or that we plan to spend, and the levy is just a portion of that. And then, for a couple of our departments, the enterprise funds, there is the total business activity that's even more than that. And that is because we have cost pools that we're required to keep track of that the budget is, those activities are reflected as net. Net, like there could be, a cost pool could be a negative, like a, like a gravel pit. It could be a negative expenses for that year because it's cost pool. So if you add the total expenses and the total revenues for that, you're going to pop it up a couple million. So the, the three different things, I remember always saying, well, if our levy is $7 million, our budget is $17 million, and our, our business activity is $27 million, you know, or something like that. But I'd like to, I just wanted to share that those differences may come to light as we move forward. And uh, from our, uh, our perspective as board members, it's nice to know the difference. All right, if there's no other questions, I'll turn you back over to the rest of your business items. Thank you, <coughs> uh, Ken. Uh, next item on the agenda is the um, uh, circuit court update. Uh, Chief Judge Needham. Thank you, and uh, I'm going to have to report and run because I have a uh, calendar starting, and well, it started right now. Um, there, I think just a few things I, I want to bring to your attention. Uh, there are probably more related to legislation or policy decisions, but it's things that we've recognized that, that I want, again, to highlight. Before I do that, though, I want to um, recognize uh, the sheriff and his department for 
a response to a situation that occurred two nights ago uh, involving potential threat to one of uh, my colleagues and it came up really at the end of the day into the early evening um, and we were triaging with the sheriff and his staff and, and they responded in uh, a way that I don't think any of us really appreciate their ability to respond and, and assist. I don't want to go any further because it's an ongoing case, but just to thank the sheriff for after hours uh, responding to something that we became aware of and, and uh, he and his staff really, really jumped on board quickly and, and provided uh, very appropriate response. Um, secondly, I think you all, well, none of you would remember because I don't think any of you were on the county board in 2015 when we approved the uh, front door security. Uh, we went to a single point of access. Everyone uh, was required and still is required to go through security. For those of you that sit on the building committee, you know that with this new plan, there's going to be an employee only entrance so A, we're gonna to have to revisit that policy, and B, we're going to have to discuss that policy as relates to the court wing of this building. And so I just bring that to your attention. I know it's two plus years away, but if it's on your radar, then we can at least start exploring what options are out there. Something else that uh, Mr. Witt brought up that a lot of the clerk of court's budget is what I call some sufficient, in other words, what she spends, she has to spend. We don't have any discretion. So jury fees, witness fees, guardian ad litem, uh, those expenses, whatever they are, we have to cover. An area that has been growing and that I think uh, is in the budget is uh, court-appointed attorney fees. Now, what's not always reflected is what we recoup and we're able to collect. Now, it may take five years, but we're generally, I think, at about 80% or so of collecting those fees back. An area where we don't collect and something that I think you need to be aware of is we have a growing number of cases where individuals qualify for public defender. They're indigent, uh, but the public defender is unable to find an attorney to represent them. Uh, they may have a conflict among their staff attorneys, and so then they start their search. And there was a case recently that I tried where they were unable to find an attorney. Um, this person was in custody and so we just couldn't continue to push it out. The law requires them that I conduct hearings and have the public defender come in and tell me what efforts they're making. And in this case, I think they reached out to four or 500 attorneys statewide and no one would take the case. Well, the Constitution guarantees that that matter go to trial, and so I had to appoint an attorney at county expense, albeit they qualified for public defender. The current rules and regulations are that the county pays. Um, because it's public record, we just got the bill, and it was over $30,000 uh, that the county is going to have to absorb, that we have no ability to recoup because this person was indigent. What I think is arguably something uh, the county should look at is I went then to the public defender and said, okay, this was a public defender eligible defendant. You would have paid that attorney $70 an hour. Can we recoup that? And the answer is no. There is no ability currently in state law or in the administrative regs for a county to recoup from the public defender what would have otherwise been an expense that they would have covered. So I bring that to your attention. Uh, there's a pending lawsuit in Green Bay right now involving inmates who have been in custody for a significant period of time who don't have public defenders. And so this is coming uh, to a head, so to speak. Uh, I think St. Croix is, is generally a county that doesn't have the same problem as the Burnett and Washburns and some of our more remote counties and finding attorneys, but it's coming and it's something, again, that if there is a means to at least review that policy and at least recoup what we can from that agency. Uh, again, that's something that I'm not promoting, but something that you may want to look at. The other thing is um, restitution. By statute, if someone owes restitution, so uh, it's a theft, uh, it's a, a crime that involves an injury where there's medical uh, damages, there's property damage, uh, 
we will require a defendant who's convicted to pay restitution. The preferred alternative for people uh, who have been uh, found guilty is to put them on probation, and then we order that they pay their restitution as part of their probation. It's required that it be paid through probation. In other words, we don't have the ability to say, well, pay it to the clerk of courts and we'll monitor it. If you're put on probation, it has to be paid through probation. We're a border county, and so a number of our defendants are from Minnesota. That probation is transferred to Minnesota, and under the interstate compact, Minnesota will not collect restitution for a case where probation is from Wisconsin. So at the end of that person's probation, we're getting requests now to convert that to a civil judgment where there's been no effort to collect and no collections made. Again, it's something that I think potentially uh, could be explored uh, through the interstate compact, but again, as a border county, we see it day in, day out. So we're, as judges, considering uh, having probation review hearings where we bring these people from Minnesota over to say, okay, you're not paying it through your agent, but are you paying anything? That's going to take time, but again, we're trying to find ways to hold people accountable so that at the end of their three years of probation, and they owe $40,000 of restitution, they paid zero. Um, so that's, again, just something that more awareness than anything else uh, for your group. So that's my report. Chairman. Uh, Judge, just to follow up on what you just mentioned, um, uh, you mentioned that, it, that it's governed, your relations with Minnesota are governed by the interstate compact. Who would change that? There's an interstate commission, in other words, there are representatives from Wisconsin, representatives from Minnesota, and in fact, we have a lot of uniform laws, uh, uh, child custody, there are uniform laws at all 50 states, some of these uniform laws are signed on by all 50 states, others are groupings of states, but it would be this, in, there's an interstate commission that looks at these types of, of uh, agreements and, and uh, understanding, so to speak, so that's who I think I'm, not an expert, but my guess is these interstate compacts, whether it's child welfare, uh, supervision for probation, are all covered under a commission. And, and just, I'm, I feel a little bit stupid about this area, but that would be a national commission, not an interstate commission Probably, between Wisconsin uh, and Minnesota. It could be national, but I'm guessing it's more regional. In other words, we have an agreement with Minnesota. Oh, okay that when they send people here to be supervised, these are the expectations. When we send people over there, these are the expectations, or the rules, I guess better said, and the rule in Minnesota is they will not collect Wisconsin restitution. And, and what do we do with regard to Minnesota defendants? I think through this interstate process, there could be negotiations or discussions mm -hmm. about, okay, uh, if we're going to supervise your people, uh, you know, maybe we can work out some process by which something could be changed. And maybe we can't do anything. Well, I'm just saying yeah. we're seeing it a lot. I wonder, Supervisor Fiedler, the county's association meetings coming up, I mean, I, we're a border county, but there's, you know, La Crosse would have the same issues. So maybe there's something we can find out there. But I think you're right, it probably is a state level, like, combination, just like reciprocity for tuition. I mean, it's like you have to get the people to agree on both sides. It's above our level, but we could do a resolution that recommends that the, that the state do this. I mean, we could do something at the county level to encourage that behavior, whether it'll happen, who knows, but we can at least try to get other counties that are in the same predicament to do the same thing. I, got, <clears throat> I think that's a great point. Um, unfortunately, I think the way our, our WCA works, their resolutions deadline was a couple of months ago. So, so well, but we, we can put it in the pipeline for the future and start the process of understanding it more, but um, I'm, I'm like you, I wish we could bring it up in three weeks at the next meeting and, and get something done. Thanks for bringing that up, Judge, and, and uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, are there any questions for the judge? If there are not, thanks, Judge. Thank <laughs> um, Justice Services update, uh, Mr. Golly. Sure, thank you, Chairman. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about MRT we are taking over in Justice Services Moral Recognition Therapy, which is a cognitive behavioral program. Um, our expectation is still to start facilitating those groups the first week of October. We have two of our staff who are currently trained. 
They're going to be doing some observation in September down in Pierce County. And we are in the process of narrowing down day, time, and location of where we'll be offering those groups. Um, so that will begin here in the next 30 days. Oh, and I'll just add to that. Uh, we will have a contract with the Department of Corrections. So folks that are on probation will participate in those groups. Um, we'll also have referrals from diversion as well as treatment court. Um, but with Department of Corrections, there will be some revenue that's generated um, because of that contract. I may be confusing things here a little bit, but uh, does this also begin to answer a question that had come up for the judges relative to how MRT would be handled as opposed to, uh, I, again, I may be confusing issues here with, with the Department of Health and Human Services? Yep, so the HHS, they stopped this contract with the Department of Corrections and offering it in general um, on June 30th. So it's kind of been dormant for the last 60 days. Um, but uh, we will be taking over that contract as well as the other clients that were serviced in the county. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, it, it does, and I think it fills a big void too by doing that. Um, just one last uh, question. I know uh, you had been working on uh, some interesting and creative projects with the University of Wisconsin Extension Services. Could you update us on that? Sure. Um, so we um, just very recently, we've been working on it for about a month, but we applied uh, through UW-Madison, our justice services, to be considered for a program. It's called University City Year, and it's actually a two to three year program. Partnership between uh, municipality, county, government, um, and UW-Madison, the idea is that we would partner with a department at the university and they would help us support certain projects that we had in mind. So we identified two projects um, that I think both our treatment court and our pretrial division um, are in need of. Uh, the first is help with placing people in residential uh, substance use treatment. And the second is sober living facilities for women and their children in the county. And I actually got the application in last week, uh, got a call that there is a faculty member at UW-Madison in their public health department uh, that has a master's uh, class um, running this fall that is interested in our projects. Uh, so I was anticipating this kind of being pushed off into 2023, but this will actually start next week. I have a meeting on Tuesday. Um, so that'll be good. That's exciting. Um, I'll, I'll know more information after Tuesday's meeting. I'll be able to present that at the CJCC meeting on Thursday. Um, but that project is off and running, um, which is great. It'll, it'll be uh, a, a nice um, project. That's awesome. Yes. You're doing great work. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, it'll it'll be good. We're uh, we're excited. Like I said, I, I was anticipating it taking a while, which it's better that it's starting. Um, so hopefully, I'm not sure if it'll carry over past this fall semester. But um, like I said, I'll report back on that meeting, and and we'll know more next week. Uh, next item on our agenda, we'll turn to our medical examiner, uh, Patty Schachter. Good morning. I'll make my report short and sweet. Um, right now we're about 10 cases behind uh, last year, uh, which uh, is good for us as far as workload. Um, nationally, uh, life expectancy now has dropped for the second uh, year in a row. So this is uh, also something that uh, we have uh, seen here in the county. Um, like the judge had brought up, collections is an issue in our department also. Could, could, yeah. I, could I jump in for just mm -hmm. one second? Uh, you mentioned life expectancy is down, down by about two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I understand it, it's primarily as a result, uh, just a little bit of COVID, but primarily as a result of opioid uh, deaths and particularly fentanyl. And, and suicide. And suicide. Yeah, yeah. And, but about 80,000 of those d premature deaths are fentanyl. Yep. And um, I know you and the sheriff and the judges had been, and the district attorney at the time had been very active a couple of years ago when we held a, uh, I'll call it a, a, a drug response symposium. I can't remember what exact title we put on it, but you folks all brought everybody in the community up to date on the urgency of the problem, what we were doing about it, uh, different uh, avenues. 
do you think we've arrived at the point where we need to do something like, uh, let's just say an emergency educational effort in this area to bring people up to speed? Because we are, just, maybe you could comment further how many fentanyl deaths you're seeing in the county and if we have a problem or if this is something that hasn't struck us yet. I think it's a combination. You know, I, I, we don't have a lot of fentanyl deaths. We do have fentanyl deaths. But there are a lot of people who also have access to Narcan and have access to correctants. So when you have a lot of uh, functioning addicts who uh, have access to the Narcan, which is a good thing because that, you know, may, helps people live, um, then that kind of gives folks a false sense of security uh, that, well, because we don't see a, a lot of people dying of fentanyl overdoses, then obviously that it's not a problem. Well, if you talk to um, addicts' families, they'll tell you, you know, it was through good policy that the Narcan programs came in, but with that also, um, you know, when people struggle with addiction, they usually uh, use in groups, so, and they usually have Narcan, so if something happens, they can give Narcan, and a lot of times we never even hear about it. So can, it's a catch-22. If I may add sure. something to that, it was something I was going to talk about, but I think now is the appropriate time. Um, Terry did run some numbers for me. Since the first of the year, law enforcement, um, whether it be in the jail, Hudson PD, out on the freeway, or the sheriff's office, 20 times we've used Narcan since the first of the year, reversing the effects. So that's potentially 20 deaths mm -hmm. averted. And that's just law enforcement. Uh, Patty's absolutely right on what we don't know mm -hmm. with families, friends. Um, there's one of these overdoses that we went to just recently that the family had already administered Narcan when we got there. Mm -hmm. um, and we administered, I think, a bit more. So it's, it's interesting that that is something that we don't know. We have started a Narcan program in the jail um, where there are inmates that are that go to class, how to use Narcan. They get Narcan when they leave. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, so there's 20 that were averted. How many we don't know about, so well, you know, and I Patty's, just heard, Patty's right. I just heard this uh, weekend that there was an 11-year-old in, in this county that uh, had uh, fentanyl-laced THC um, and uh, that that child uh, ended up at the University of Minnesota it's home now but an 11 year old I couldn't believe it and so uh, this this issue is here and we know it but I believe it's probably a lot bigger than what we think because what I'm seeing in the I, the sheriff may concur is that there are a lot of functioning addicts amongst us that more than more than what we th we know and a lot of them are professionals are um, people who you would not expect to be uh, in that group of uh, considering addicts so um, the public education piece of it is a very sensitive uh, thing but there are a lot of addicts in St. Croix County when I see heads going <laughs> that so so that there is uh, uh, for that death uh, life expectancy you know you take away the Narcan even in our county would change what our numbers look like and our data looks like uh, significantly maybe I can just jump in for a minute and ask uh, Supervisor Leaf and Ramberg uh, uh, just a, a thought um, I know I had attended a program a couple months ago on our suicide prevention and Patty was a lead speaker at that, and and uh, we'd, a, a table had been set up, and I just regret I can't remember the name of the individual who manned the table from the county, mm -hmm. who is our Narcan uh, oh. coordinator. Oh. Uh, she's in the building here, and, and she's so nice, but I just forgot her name. Cara. <laughs> yeah, Cara, that's yeah. it. Uh, would we benefit perhaps from hearing from Cara? And uh, she gave a very short, she gave the abbreviated program at our program. Uh, she could do that in about 10 minutes for us. But then I also took a number of Narcan packets and I've distributed them to people that I thought, not, not, not addicts necessarily, but entities that might have addicts in their environment. And um, we might want to 
I request that she bring a number of packets for the committee and then we could know precisely how it really works because we hear about Narcan all the time but it might be, but would that be helpful? Yes. Okay, uh, we'll do that at the next meeting and I'll coordinate that. Thanks, Betty, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, um, and then again, uh, I'm working with finance on uh, collections because uh, that there is also a problem in our, in our uh, uh, office and the sad thing is, you know, we can't withhold services to families because certain people aren't paying. So it's kind of a catch-22, but we're working on that. Um, we're seeing an increase in complex uh, scene, visit, scene visits uh, due to natural deaths because there is little or no medical history, little or no connection to the community, and little or no next of kin. So we have a whole population of folks that have lived and worked in St. Croix County for decades that have no connection that would help with our work, which then makes our work that much harder. Um, um, we also had another homicide uh, this past weekend. I'm very proud of my staff for the work that they do uh, in these complex cases. Um, I don't know if it's just based, if it's a trend or if this is our community is growing and uh, the homicide rate is growing. Um, primarily, it's domestic violence. Um, what we're seeing in the office also is uh, younger people dying from alcohol-related alcohol cirrhosis of the liver. Um, this is uh, also another thing that we're seeing a lot, which then also ties into the addiction piece. And then the final thing is we've had three infants under the age of one who have died of pneumonia in a 12-month period, not COVID-related. Um, so as we go, this is a heartbreaking situation for everybody involved. Uh, with that in mind, my whole team is taking uh, a sudden unexpected death investigator class for uh, infants and children. Um, it's a five hour class and it's free, so they're doing it on their time to get back reintroduced to a uh, doll reenactment. I'm also gonna buy that second doll reenactment kit for, so that we have one in both. Uh, vehicles because doll reenactment is really the best way to answer the questions. Um, but as we look at the cold and flu season, um, we know that we've had bronchial pneumonia, we've had RSV, and then uh, we had a uh, bacterial pneumonia. So it's with uh, children. So we're going to look into it deeper with child death review. But um, clearly, there is a difference between. Uh, the anatomic goings on of a five-year-old child and an infant and really um, bringing in, in child death review, you know, is this something that we have to talk to parents about, you know, uh, in, you know, the signs and symptoms of uh, respiratory distress. And uh, that's all I have this month. Oh, and the machine will be installed at uh, the end of September. Could I just follow up just to, for a second on that last item on the, I'll call it the infant deaths, or maybe a five and unders. Uh, I know you'd reported at the last meeting that there had been, I think, six deaths in the county of yep. under ones uh, up to that point. And I don't know if that's, is that an increase or is that a fairly steady number that you've seen? Um, unfortunately, uh, late term stillbirths is a very common thing. And it, we have been seeing that for years. Uh, but a late, a late uh, or a early, oh, I gotta think this out. When a, when a, the way statutes work, 20 weeks and before is a product of conception and there's no birth certificate or death certificates. 20 weeks and after, if they're born and take a breath, then they get a birth certificate and a death certificate. If they're born stillborn, they, there's no documentation that they were ever born. However, it is reportable to us. We have to make sure, is there any medical records that state there's addiction? Is there, was there any trauma? Was this a car accident? Was there reason in that? But if that uh, reportable birth takes a breath, it still is in the same category for us as the ones that don't take a breath. Does that make sense? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the medical exam? Uh, we'll turn to the sheriff. And I'll jump up to the podium, but 
as, as Patty mentioned, uh, yeah, there was another homicide this weekend. Um, so tomorrow in the courthouse, uh, there is a hearing in the morning um, on some things. It won't be a big hearing, but it's from the stabbing in Hudson. That gentleman will be in court. Um, later in the morning is the preliminary hearing for the Apple River incident. And then in the afternoon is the homicide from last weekend. So the courthouse will have hearings on three homicides all tomorrow. So. So I wanted to touch upon um, really more of a um, talking about uh, receiving cells, special needs cells. Um, so we'll kind of go back to when you guys did the jail inspection and tour a uh, couple months ago. And I know there's several years ago we had special needs cells uh, put into what was the gym and special needs cells. And um, I think there's some confusion with some on the difference between receiving cells, special needs cells, their uses, um, what we should be looking forward to as we um, look at building years down the road. I don't know, 510. Um, but it's this is really more of a why we have what we have and why we how we use those things. Um, I am going to jump tabs. in. Tabs on top. All right. I need to listen to Janet more. She tells me that every day. So this is kind of an overview of the jail. And there's three um, color-coded highlighted areas. Uh, the special housing unit, those are those special need cells. Um, that is what, that is where the gym once was located. Uh, and then in green, you have the receiving cells. And then we've got the shower and we'll talk about that as well. Um, up in this area is the garage. And when somebody gets brought in, they get brought into the processing area and then they come into the booking area. So receiving cells are just that, where they're received. Um, there's a move and a shift in a lot of other counties with new building constructions. Um, when we were built in 90, when we opened in 93, built in the, a couple years before that or a year before that, um, the receiving cells were used or planned on being used for people that come in um, that have, and what they've been used for since that time, um, those that come in that are intoxicated, that are uh, substance abuse coming down, they may be gonna crash, um, suicide watches, uh, and our suicide watches are also broken down into time frames. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so the receiving cells for many years have been used for housing of those with um, specific watchable things. Um, so right now there's a gentleman up there that um, has seizures and has refused to take his meds. So he needs to be watched. We can't put him in the special housing unit because there's not somebody there to watch him physically and by when people are on watches, our state DOC code, Department of Correction code, doesn't allow a camera to be a constant visual. It's gotta be a person. So the receiving cells are still used for those that need special attention. There's also disciplinary um, or removal from somebody that's been in a fight they had always gone up to the receiving cells. They don't go into the special housing units. Um, so those receiving cells are still used for uh, a number of things other than receiving. 
Um, I always uh, refer back to the Aaron Schaffhausen homicide back in 2012. Um, because of certain circumstances and his um, refusal to speak with, um, which is his right, but to answer any of the suicide questions, we always had to have him on a suicide watch. So he stayed in R3 for 14 months. That was a cell we couldn't use for 14 months. Um, so as we look forward on what we should be looking at in the future, you recall this is the hallway booking area with the uh, three receiving cells. And here's a holding cell. The holding cell is kind of like a bullpen. Um, it's people just waiting for bond, um, waiting to get changed over maybe that are in the process of being booked. So that is not a housing unit. It's really a holding area. So we still have the three, and this is the cell that it's our main observation one. Um, and when we talk about observation, we talk about our watches. There's medical watches and there's suicide watches. Suicide watches can be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, or general watch of an hour. So if they're at a 15 minute watch, somebody's sitting and booking 24 hours a day. Uh, they maybe can get up and run to the property room, but they can't go down and help serve meals. They can't go down and work at the pod. They can't go bring somebody in at the front door. Um, we have to have somebody there. So these receiving cells, other counties are using receiving cells for that receiving. Eau Claire has 20 or 30 receiving cells. And what they do is when somebody gets brought in, they get booked in and they remain in the receiving cell. They don't go down to the pod with general population. They go into one of their receiving cells and they stay there until their initial court appearance. If after their initial court appearance, they have a bond that they can't post, they're held for whatever reason, then they would go down into that general population. It really became glaring to us over the COVID years of if we had a block that was COVID free and you bring in somebody from the outside on a warrant for a hundred dollars, well, you got to put them somewhere. And if they're sick, we got nowhere to put them. So we had a COVID block and then uh, we had in that COVID block was an area that they stayed in for however many hours tested and then we tried to put them throughout the rest of the building. So if we just had 20, 30 receiving cells, we could have isolated till they went to court to see if they're going to stay and where we put place them after that. Um, one of the other uh, receiving benefits of having more receiving cells would be contraband. Now we have a body scanner, but that's not perfect. It's not 100%. There's always human error. There's always compliance of the person that doesn't want to go in. Um, it would be another way to put them in a receiving cell. They go to court. If they stay, then they go in the back. Strip search. However, we ensure, do our very best to ensure that they're not bringing contraband back to the other inmates. Um, as it is now, uh, they get through the, through the body scanner, back into the general population. Um, again, the body scanner has helped tremendously. But we still have instances where uh, they have placed it in an area that it gets back to the blocks, and we still have um, some instances where 
uh, some bad narcotics have made it back into the blocks. Um, future receiving cells, as we look forward, would help to mitigate that um, because also if they're bringing it in and they're stuck in a receiving cell for 24 hours, they're probably going to try to use that. So at least we have them in a spot where we can observe it um, and potentially uh, keep it out of the back block area. In our jail inspection on the 12th by uh, Brad Hoover from the Department of Corrections, he noted um, that uh, during my inspection of the facility, it was noted that all receiving cells were occupied. It seems to be a reoccurring issue whenever I'm at the facility and has been referenced in past inspections. This limits the staff's ability to properly house inmates for admissions, investigations, discipline, and suicide watch. It's recommended that the agency consider adding additional receiving cells as this would provide the facility better options for housing inmates as they deem necessary. Uh, we ran. Janet, how do I? What's that? It's not working. There it is, all right. So we took a daily head count of the days used per month for the receiving cells. You'll see on the top line, uh, in July, 24 out of 31 days, there was somebody in receiving cell number one. 26 days in receiving cell number two, 15 in receiving cell three. So you can see how many times each cell was used over the past 12 months. Um, that's, a lot of t that's a lot of days where somebody has been assigned to those receiving cells. Uh, and again, that limits. There's times on Fridays we're moving people around um, and prioritizing the most critical person to remain up there. And then we try to find the best placement for those we don't have room for in those three receiving cells. Whether it be pairing them up in a block that doesn't, um, we don't anticipate will flare up whatever issue they have going. Or putting them in a double bunk cell so they have a roommate. Um, the juggling is... The juggling is challenging, um, and each move could also bring different liabilities with it. Um, so things that I hope we look for as we look into the receiving um, future. The other thing I wanted to bring up on receiving, those are the special needs cells uh, that we talked about, and they have their own little day room. Um, and as you walk through there, we recognize that. But I do want to talk about, um, back to the receiving component on those that are in there, in receiving one, two, and three. Um, and if they're non-compliant, it's difficult to get them out into a shower, to get them offered a shower daily. Uh, the one phone is on this wall in the hallway. So for them to get out, we have a rolling cart now that they can do um, the video to call home, the Zoom. But there are some inmates that um, they believe sometimes electronics give off um, electrical waves that interferes with their well-being. Um, 
So they damage things, they destroy things, they tear them, tip them, whatever it might be. So to roll a cart in there, it's, it's costly. But you want to make sure, if you can, uh, to give them the ability to reach out, contact home, talk to somebody. These receiving cells don't offer that. Again, a phone on the wall. If they get out into the hallway, once again, unsecured, somebody has to be standing right there. Can't let them just walk around. We can't leave them. Same with the shower. Those that are non-compliant, they get into the shower, somebody has to be waiting. If we fight with them to get them back in or they're non-compliant to go back into their receiving cell, we're out in the hallways. They're wet. Those are difficult uh, struggles. Receiving, everything's contained. In their special needs cells, everything's contained. So um, other, th other areas that, um, and we even with Brad Hoover talking with him, he was here two days ago, and it was discussed, how do we, what can we do to put a door here? Um, to at least give us the opportunity to contain somebody that may not be compliant, may not be in their, uh, could be a mental health issue, could be a crisis issue. Um, same thing with bringing somebody in and booking them. Some of them come in that have either been sprayed, they have um, covered in blood, uh, other body fluids because they're so drunk. Um, then we got to throw them in the shower. And it's, again, uh, the jail staff has, uh, they have their hand full on a number of days. Um, and as we talk about our Jail population. We're back up there again. Um, we go back all the way to 2003. We had 92. You can see the pattern and the trend. We get down from Jumping years to months. Here we get into COVID, 79, 75. And now we're ramping right back up. We're at 127 as of yesterday. Um, there's 10 more out on EHM, electronic home monitoring, that prior to electronic home monitoring would have been in the jail in the Huber area, um, which would have made it 137. Back in July of... 19, you see 2019, the average was 123, but in July, if I bring it up every time, we hit 151. Our max capacity is 185, but we don't reach the max capacity. And there's also, when we talk about, okay, well, we still can put 30 people in, but we're using areas that were built for Hubers to house general population inmates. So we, we also then try to, because we also have, um, if there are no contacts, we have to classify each inmate. So we don't put in the $10 seatbelt ticket with one of the stabbers accused of the stabbing. Um, we don't want them in the same housing unit because they're classified differently. But we only have so many areas to separate. So one of the Huber, that's why we are sticking with electronic home monitoring, which has its pros and it has its cons. Um, but we're sticking with that because to bring 10 people back in could displace a minimum security group from the pod and then put them back into the pod. And while you can house up to 24 
in A, 24 in B, 20 in C. When you're at full capacity in those, the tensions run high. There's one TV in there. There's one kiosk for a phone. And when you put 24 people in there that are not happy about being in jail, you can feel the tension in the dorms, in the, in the pod area. So things I hope that we consider as we move forward, looking into the future, um, some of our challenges that we deal with today. So I've thrown a lot out. I hope I didn't bounce too much, Mr. Chair. I'll no, I think we appreciate the update uh, in great detail like this. Just a quick question. Uh, what, what's the short-term recommendation you'd have, uh, Sheriff? And then wh wh where do you think we're going in the long term? I know we've talked about additional facilities, as you said, several years out, but what, what are the near-term recommendations you might make? I don't know if there's a short-term quick fix. Um, you know, it's, it's a whole component and, and I, I know people understand it, but not everybody understands it, about, well, you have too many people in jail. Well, law enforcement makes an initial arrest. The courts then deem if they should be held or if they should be out on bond. Bond is set in certain cases. There are those that have, after um, sentencing, there's probation. Those that violate probation are placed in here. Department of Corrections with uh, the DOC housing area in Richmond with the boot camp. Those going to, those coming from that flunk are housed here. Other counties housed. And there's branching off when I say other counties are housed. Um, if somebody's here on a warrant for uh, a surrounding county and also held on a local charge here um, in the past if they had court in another county they'd be transferred to that county they'd have court a couple days maybe a new bond would be set up there new restrictions they'd be housed you know it's kind of a free flow of many jails now with zoom and they can do court remotely, uh, there's other counties that have their inmates here. Um, you know, we have a charge that's holding them here, but they have a more severe charge that they should be held in that other county, but they can just do some of those things by Zoom, so they keep them here. So there are others. So what is the answer? I don't know if there's a quick short answer um, we just continue to juggle uh, you know again we, we look at the numbers from the COVID era um, some things were changed more were out on EHM more I mean even those that were on I mean bonds were remodified there was there was a, a push to uh, attempt to mitigate the spread of COVID um, and with keeping public safety in mind, um, we still have to keep public safety in mind still. So I don't know if there's a quick fix right now. Uh, uh, Sheriff, uh, uh, you've raised some very, very good points here. Um, I suspect some of them are probably best handled through further conversations and, and uh, talk about this, uh, maybe not necessarily at one of our PPJ meetings. Um, and uh, I think we'd all look forward to uh, further questions and, and receipt of suggestions from you on that and further discussions on that. Um, would any other comments from anybody? Um, Sheriff, um, I, I guess I'll just say, I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll just say thank you for the presentation and we'll, we'll, we'll stop at that point unless you've got something else to add. No, I, I just wanted to go through receiving and excited. I know in, in some previous board conversations, 
when we say um, we need more receiving cells, the initial is, well, we just put all these special needs cells in there. Why do we need more? But they're different. They're, they're, they're truly different housing um, directions. And I don't know, I mean, Jim Ellsbury is like a miracle worker, and I don't know if he's, you've been talking with him in facilities about maybe brainstorming some short-term fixes too, but I don't know, it's very complicated. I don't know, when you don't have the space, you don't have the space. <laughs> so you, you can't you create a space, space like. <laughs> yeah, and there's, I mean, even, there's areas that are jail proper, so it's not just like moving moving walls. It's not making bigger rooms, smaller rooms, so let's move this room over here. Everything is detention grade. And anything outside of that is not gonna meet DOC codes. Thank you. Thanks, Sheriff. Um, I think at this point we'll just move, move along. Request for future agenda items. Um, hearing none, we'll go to announcements and correspondence. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Patty Shacker. Um, once the uh, CT machine is in, before we're in full operation, it would be great if you guys would come and take a look at uh, what's going on there. Uh, give us a little time frame that might be convenient. It will be installed September 26th, so any time during October should be good. Um, a good recommendation, and I think we'd probably like to do that. Uh, the problem a little bit in perhaps in October is that we have um, our, it's another budget meeting where the administrator will come back and so that may not be as convenient as it might otherwise be to do it in October. November is fine. It, it um, just, you know, before we're up and running, I really, I would rather have it before we're full on up and running than having <coughs> bodies in, the, in there. <laughs> well, do you think that it would be, I mean, before the installation though wouldn't make sense, so would not make sense, but, or maybe, I mean, watching it go in, I guess would be interesting yeah, too, but I, mean, I don't know. I don't know, as this is gonna be the first one in the state so I think for you guys to get a look at it, even if it's at your own time, whatever, so that when we start talking about it, I know the Wisconsin Coroners and Medical, Associ Medical Examiners Association is very excited about it. There's just gonna be a lot of uh, talk about this here and uh, how future, futuristic it is. So I would like you guys to, when, if you have a chance, come and take a look. Well, I think it's a good idea, and I think we all agree. And, and I'll, I'll try to work with you on a date, and maybe we might even need a special uh, meeting for that to come up if we can work out a time that's convenient for everybody, and, and so we'll follow up on that. Uh, any other uh, observations, questions? Um, with that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>